everybody. In this podcast episode today, we warmly welcome Professor Helen Kelly Holmes from the School of Modern Languages and Applied Linguistics here at the University of Limerick. Helen is an active member of the Centre for Applied Language Studies, having previously served as director of the centre. In addition, she served as Dean of the Faculty of AHSS and has very recently completed this no doubt challenging but highly rewarding role. Helen has a wide range of research and teaching interests under the broad umbrella of sociolinguistics. So we're all eager, Helen, today to hear more about your research interests in this podcast. So let us begin with the first question, Helen. And can you tell all the postgraduate researchers listening to this podcast today a little bit about your research area of expertise? Mm -hmm. OK, thanks very much, Michelle. And first of all, um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to take part in the podcast. It's a really great series and I'm delighted to be included. So thank you. Um, yeah, so my area is sociolinguistics and that's, I mean, at its most basic, it's it's an interest in language in society. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in how language works in society and how people use and abuse language in society. I'm particularly interested in how people use language as an instrument of control in society. So one area I work on a lot is language policy. And, mm. um, you know, I suppose on the surface, language policy is about um, you know, managing languages. But for me, that's only the start of it, really. Why do we manage language in society? What else are we trying to manage? And usually there is some issue around power, resources, access going on, uh, controlling people, controlling resources, something like that. So that's that's what gets me interested. And, and, and I'm very interested in that whole area. Um, linked to that, I'm also interested in minority languages. I'm interested in multilingualism. Um, more at a societal level, I guess, than at an individual level. So I'm interested in it in areas like media. Um, I've done a lot of work on advertising and multilingualism. And I'm also interested, again, in the kind of the, the economic dimension or even, mm -hmm. I suppose, the political economy of language. So what is, you know, in whose interests is it to uh, use languages like this or uh, to control languages like this or to maintain languages like this? And, and what is being achieved and what are the, the, the wider outcomes? And um, I suppose inevitably at the moment, given those interests, I'm, I'm very focused on language and technology as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been doing quite a bit of work on, on that. So I hope you can see the connection between all of that. Um, but that's so the, the sort of broad is, area I'm interested a in. A wide mm -hmm. scope in that, mm -hmm. even you said from moving from language policy and even now to the current trends of mm -hmm. uh, language policy and even looking at technology and how that relates. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. It's fascinating how broad your research mm -hmm. has, I suppose, was achieved over these years and throughout your career, Helen. And um, what I want to go back is way back to the beginning. <laughs> what really first attracted you to your academic discipline or where did this research area stem from? Yeah, so I mean, so yeah, I, I suppose I've had a, a, an untypical start in the sense that yeah. I actually did business studies. So yeah. I started out doing business studies in languages and I did uh, German and I, I enjoyed the business studies, but I really enjoyed the German and I loved German and I it was my strongest subject and I really wanted to teach and I uh, I saw what the, 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 the teachers did in university and I thought I want to do that. So I suppose I started really from wanting to teach. Um, and then people were telling me, well, you'll have to do research if you want to teach. And so I suppose I had quite an instrumental approach, which sounds terrible, you know, but but I wanted to do this job and um, and that. And, you know, people are saying, well, if you want to do the job, you you need to do to do research. And at that point in time, and I think this was maybe a mistake I, that I made. Mm -hmm. I did get some advice to go and do an MA in applied linguistics or in linguistics because I didn't really have a strong linguistics background, obviously, having done the degree that I did. Um, but a, a scholarship opportunity came up and I, and I took it. So, you know, I, and, and, and that was in the UK in Birmingham. So mm -hmm. I, I took advantage of that and I got it. Um, but I suppose I had to do a lot of catch up work myself. Now, it can be done, but I suppose to have taken the year to do the MA would have probably helped, I think, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, and the area I picked, I suppose I, I had specialised in marketing in my business degree and I was interested in that. Mm -hmm. So that's my interest in kind of advertising, media, all of that sort of comes yes. from there. And I had also spent some time on the working on the east-west German border just before the Berlin Wall came down. And so I found that 
that whole situation fascinating. Um, so I ended up doing my PhD on advertising as a new discourse in East Germany following the fall of the Berlin Wall. So it kind of brought all of my interests together. Together, yeah. Um, yeah. And then I suppose at that point in time as well in, in, in linguistics, I suppose a, a very interesting thing that was happening, I mean, it seems old hat now, but was the emergence of CDA, of critical discourse analysis. And um, I remember going to a BAL, British Association for Applied Linguistics conference as a postgrad and hearing Norman Fairclough give a talk about it. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing, you know? And I went back to my supervisor who was a very traditional, uh, traditional in many ways. I mean, he was he yes. was a, a literature scholar um, who had studied in, in Oxford, um, but he was also interested in language and business. He had done a lot of work for uh, on language and exports. And I said, this is an amazing theory. And have you come across this? And, and he was like, well, off you go, you know, if you want to look at that. So that did influence me a lot, I think, because at, th at the time that I was kind of acquiring these skills and really soaking up a lot of things, um, I came across CDA and I suppose that that would be a piece of advice I'd have for postgrads is to be very open go to as many things as you can and you'll get inspiration from from areas you might not think think of you know so um really so great that's sort of how I how I came across my 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 niche I suppose you know, and, uh, and wasn't it fantastic that you won this scholarship and yeah. you know the doors that op that opened up in terms of opportunities for you and how everything came together as you yeah. talk in your experience yeah there yeah you couldn't have planned it yeah timing and luck you know have a lot to do with these <laughs> things as well, well yeah so Helen I suppose thinking back to that time um as you you know you mentioned there that as a postgraduate student you went to conferences and, and all the rest and you had a great um role model as well you know in terms of role models if we look at this concept in itself is there anybody that stands out to you as being a role model back when you were doing your PhD or during that time that might have had a great impact on you? Yeah, it's interesting, this discussion about role models, because um, at that point in time, um, the uh, and, and this memory came back to me recently because I was at a conference and I was asked to think of an example um, from this context. Like everybody in that in that department was well, all the professors were men. They were all uh, British men who had gone to a certain type of education, you know, uh, who'd yes. been through sort of public schools, Oxbridge, that sort of thing, or kind of scholarship system. So it was they're very different to me, I would say, um, and uh, and that. So I I did have a great mentor in the form of of Sue. Right, she's very well known in language uh, policy, yes. but Sue was really struggling to get up that career path. She had mm -hmm. been a, a secondary teacher for a long time and she'd come into research just because she was genuinely interested. She was working with a lot of in very kind of mixed um, sixth form college and she wanted to investigate this idea of whether getting literacy in your mother tongue before literacy in say English as an academic language would be a good idea. So she came from, with a real world problem that she wanted to investigate and her research grew from there. And so for me, she was always a great role model. And um, mm -hmm. uh, and and also when I came to Limerick, I found um, Angela Chambers, who had the chair in applied languages before me, a great role model, a really generous colleague, um, a really, um, you know, always yes. making time for people, um, always kind of uh, really, you know, thinking about the big picture, thinking about everybody um, and really interested in mentoring and and bringing people on and giving great advice. So these would be the people I would probably have tried to model myself on or would have, would have seen the really great characteristics um, there. But That's some nice. of the really big professors in the department, I, I, I had very little in common with them and they had very little in common with me. So I didn't really model myself around them. And I, I've been very convinced all along that we need different models of leadership in universities. Um, yes. And I think a lot of what's played out over the last 20 years has, has really shown us that. Helen, you really touched on some fascinating mm. points there, particularly, I think, from a female perspective, right? Mm. And the role models that you mentioned there were your colleagues, you were closely beside them, and they were all female, mm. which is really mm. interesting to, to anyone listening to this podcast today. Yeah, and I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, I had... I, I probably shouldn't say this, but my supervisor, he's a very nice man and everything like that, but <laughs> I used to... He used to I used to bring his books back to the library for him. I used to collect his dry cleaning for him. This was the, I used to do his teaching when he wasn't around, you know, he would just, it was just expected. It was a completely different model of kind of, um, uh, you know, he was sort of up there and I was down there and it was, yes. it was, that was, and I didn't like that. And I didn't want to replicate that at all. You know, it was quite alien to me, so. 
That's really interesting. <laughs> I think that students really listening to this today will just find that fascinating. And that leads very nicely on to the next question is your role as a female and, you know, in academia. How has you being a female impacted your career? I know that we could touch on positives or negatives here, but especially because you've held so many managerial positions throughout your career, has being a female had more positive or negative impact? Or could you draw on both here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, I, I would say positive and negative. I've always enjoyed, so I suppose there's three aspects to academic work. There's the administrative aspect, the teaching mm-hmm. aspect and the research aspect. And I, and, I, and I would have got into it, first of all, for teaching and then kind of discovered sort of by accident my my love for research my interest in research but I've always enjoyed um the sort of management side of it as well and the administrative side and I think you, you can learn a lot from that and it's important it's important to 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 take on your roles and and to, to play your part in in all of that um yes. and I suppose within an academic career um it's very important to, I suppose to see as well and I guess this affects male colleagues too, but it certainly affects female colleagues. There will be highs and lows. There will be troughs and there will be peaks and there will be a lot of troughs, you know. So um, it's, uh, you know, I think particularly say, you know, uh, when you have children, you know, that's an obvious time when you just need to get through a few years. I mean, some people do this very well and, and manage it very well but but mm-hmm. sometimes you're just kind of you, you you're just sort of doing what you need to do for your job and and then but it will it will come right after a few years or yes. you know sometimes you 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 know women tend to take on caring roles so you might be involved in caring for older parents or something like that so it might not just be yes. a childcare thing it might be other things and and then it it you know the, the career sorts you know it, it can sort of set up but I think the more support we can give people with that so I'm a big supporter of the returning academic carers grant I think that's been a great thing for people to get their their um research kink started I think it's a little bit unfortunate that it has to happen straight after the maternity leave because I think sometimes that might be the time when you really can't focus on research and you just want to get practical things like teaching and admin done um, mm-hmm. and it might be good if that could be taken up at a later point in time but um yeah I mean the the, the positive is for me um bringing um uh bringing I suppose a a feminizing touch to leadership is important Um, I think um, for a long time the thinking was okay we mentor women and we mentor minorities and people who don't quite fit into these leadership roles and we make them fit into them and I I disagree with that and I've probably been guilty of that in the mentoring that I've done Um, and I very much feel actually no it's the other way around that when you come into these roles you really have a duty to try to change them and to not just uh uh be you know to take on the role as as it is but but to actually try and change it and try to challenge some of the um existing stereotypes and i think women are in a position to do this and probably controversially i would say women have a duty to do this i think we have an affinity with groups you know we we fought for our rights and it's important that we don't leave other groups behind and don't leave other women behind um and uh, i read kamala harris's uh, um autobiography and she says in it that her mother used to always say to her you might be the first but you shouldn't be the last and i think that's mm-hmm. that's very important so not to, not to take on this pretend um uh, image of what a leader should be based on really bad role models and stereotypes that we have and and to reshape that i think that's really important and obviously helen what you talk about there you know this comes up time and time again now we have diversity inclusion at the forefront even in our strategies mm-hmm. and i see recently the the e-emerge group in ul really focused yeah. on this you know mm-hmm. um, And you touched on there as well, um, work-life balance and Mm. especially being a mother or having other responsibilities as a PhD researcher or as an academic. Mm. There are Mm. so many challenges that this brings. But now, Helen, looking back at your younger self, (laughs) what advice would you give for that work-life balance or to any researcher Mm. listening today? Mm. Yeah. Or what was your kind of you know way how you deal with this in terms of work-life balance yeah I mean I suppose I think at certain points in time work will take up more of your life and and if you're happy with that I think that's okay um and I think for many people research can be a passion and it can be something Mm -hmm. but I but on the other hand I've always felt that research is a job and and it's not a hobby and it shouldn't be a hobby and it shouldn't have to take up all of your free time so it should be possible to do 
do the research that you need to do within the working year. Now, that's a huge challenge and people will say, oh, no way, I'll never get that done. But I think as an institution, we have to try to find ways to do that and to mm-hmm. to 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 work out ways to do that. So I've, I have always tried to do that. And I suppose only really when I'm under extreme pressure, do I do I work at weekends or in the evenings and people probably shoot me when they hear that but I really have tried to keep to that um and uh to to kind of keep that keep that balance or keep some perspective on it um I think I also feel that it's hard to give advice actually to younger colleagues at the moment because the 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 scene has changed so much since I was a postgrad and I mean I'm I'm even feeling old now talking to you here because (laughs) you know I finished my PhD there were two of us in German doing PhDs in Aston where I was Mm -hmm. and we both finished our PhDs we were both offered um, basically full-time multi-annual lectureships I had no publications I'd given one or two conference papers and so very very different and and uh, Mm -hmm. you know it was kind of oh you'll get a job and you got a job I mean that's completely changed that's really uh, change so it's very hard to advise people and it sounds very um uh, easy for me to say um to say these things you know have faith in yourself it will work out uh you know um because I think that the, the, the career situation has changed so much for people if I find I feel really sorry for people I mean when I was dean we would get applications in for for lecture below the bar posts or teaching assistant posts you know almost 100 for some of them you know 80 90 in some subjects highly qualified lots of publications so you know there's a real um uh, there's a real challenge there and 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 i don't think the number of jobs have really grown with the 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 number of people who are qualifying as phd students so you know it's it's i i was very lucky at the time that i that i qualified you know Mm -hmm. and no doubt helen as well covid 19 is going to have an impact on this as well but but i suppose phd students listening today um they have a lot of takeaway points from this talk And I suppose at the end of this to kind of finish up today is what advice would you give Helen to PhD researchers on their research journey right now? They put at the beginning, the mid, the end from all different faculties. But what advice would you kind of give to them going away from this podcast today? Yeah, I I really think being open to um, to opportunities and to uh to new things so i always remember that uh when, when i talked about sue wright but how i got to know sue was uh, mm-hmm. she came to our office we were four phd students working together and she came into the office and she had a a proposal and she she actually gave it to to a friend of mine who was researching another area um because they had they had a subject in common and it was she was she was starting a journal she was editing a journal she needed someone to be the editorial assistant and um my friend said oh I don't know about this you know it was um it was it, a tiny amount of money um she said I'm, I, I don't think I'll do this I think I, I don't think this is a good opportunity you know and then I said well would you mind if I said it and I wasn't really in that area because I hadn't really sort of settled on my PhD topic yet and Mm -hmm. and that and then I went to Sue and I said could could I do this and she said well if you want to and I I thought yeah great I can earn the money I can get the experience and that's one of the best things I ever did because I discovered all sorts of uh, that's how I met people like Nick Coupland um, all that through this through this journal Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't an obvious opportunity for me and in some ways I just sort of Mm -hmm. wanted some work I've always Mm -hmm. like working being busy so I would just say I suppose be open to opportunities um be nice be kind um you know I I I I, I I think, you know, no more than social media, peer review is blind. Um, don't do unto others what's been done unto you. If you get an unkind review, mm-hmm. um, take it on board, but but don't do that kind of thing. Don't don't mm-hmm. continue on those kind of practices. They're they're not good practices. Um make friends, you'll make great academic friends, keep them, uh networks, um, all of that sort of thing is 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 really important that the, the the networking aspect and the making friends and often often those things can be opportunities that are outside of your immediate area and it might seem as if it's haphazard but if you keep your narrative coherent you know you yes. know kind of what connects um everything and i i suppose the final thing is don't despair um i've had many moments of despair i really have <laughs> it's a lot of times giving up feeling like giving up very honest um, no it, it is it's it and, and 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 it can be like that i would say be honest about that ask for help ask mm-hmm. for advice no and and realize you will get through this and mm-hmm. the inspiration will come back or the you know focus on something very practical and that will get you through and 
th then you can start to think about the, the, that, the more abstract things, the harder things like, you know, if you get a knock, take time, yes. recover from it and and keep going. You know, that's the kind of uh, and I never had a grand plan. I'll just say that to you as no. well. I never had a vision. I just sort of went with my instinct and and with opportunities that came along. And, you know, so um, there's a lot to be said for that, I think, as, as well. Oh, it's fantastic, Helen. Really, the, the real honest kind of practical experience that you've given to us today, <laughs> really, it, it says a lot. And I think everybody can, you know, there'd be key takeaway points from this talk today. We really appreciate your time. We congratulate you uh, having completed your deanship at the Faculty of AHSS and we wish you luck on your future endeavours. So thank you very Thanks. much, Helen Kelly. Thanks, Thanks a million. You. Thanks so much, Michelle, and thank you for the talk. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.